you very much. So, this went okay, excellent. Okay, um, so my name's Scott Wilson, and I work for two different organisations. Um, I work for something called Oswatch, which is based at the University of Oxford, and it's a non-advocacy centre of expertise in open source. Um, the non-advocacy is really important. We don't tell people open source is brilliant; you must use it. We try to provide unbiased information that actually counters, if you like, some of the other misinformation you hear around the sector. So we talk to all kinds of people, both people who produce software and people who buy it. I'm also a consultant with CETIS, which is a small consultancy firm, mostly focused around open standards and interoperability. And in both these areas, we focus on education research sectors, and we do all kinds of stuff. So enterprise software analytics, interoperability, and in open source, we particularly like to focus on communities and governance and the kind of business areas that stem from that. There we go. So I want to talk about the whole research and innovation area, how it relates to working between private sector and universities. And I think a good starting point is Jeffrey Nicholson's nice little quote here, that, yeah, well, in, normally we talk about innovation. Actually, we're really about talking about is transforming knowledge into money. We're taking ideas, developing them into services. Those services become self-sustaining through revenue in some fashion. Well, they generate value, and they continue to generate value. But the main purpose is the value. Um, whereas in research, we talk about transferring money into knowledge. We're talking about finding things out. Those findings may sustain themselves in other ways, but the idea is not that to develop services, products, businesses. That's not the whole point. And when people get into working with universities, one of the first stumbling blocks is not understanding this. That thinking that a university is going to help you build a product. They're probably not. They're probably going to help you find something out that you can take and turn into a product. You've got to keep that distinction really clear. And I'll come on to some particular areas where it can get sticky. They're like this controller thing. Does it have a short range? <laughs> Hello. No, it's not working, mate. Come on. Come on. Hey, there you go. Fantastic. Um, and one of the other distinctions is to how universities and businesses operate, particularly when it comes to software. Um, and I like to come to different between science and craft. When you build software in research, the point of the software is to find something out. The point of the software is not to be software. It's to tell you something. And that means that that software may be horrifically insecure, full of bugs, written badly. It doesn't matter as long as it tells you the information you need to know, you know as long as it makes the point you're trying to make. Um, it may be fantastic code. It may be written by fantastically talented people, or it may not. It depends. But the main thing is the knowledge. It's not the actual craft of building software. Some of the things that you might expect from the software industry in terms of standard process, you will not find in university. You may be, sh may be shocked. You may partner with the university for building some software and find out that they've never used source control. They've never seen an issue tracker. They have no idea about licensing. You know, this can happen. Um, you may find that they may be quite good in most things, but they don't have a concept of IP due diligence with regard to software, which has a real problem with risks of open source. If you can't tell what was written by whom, and which bits they wrote, and which bits they copied and pasted from somewhere on the internet, because, you know, it's just code. It's not the, whole, not the main thing they're producing. So, one of the things working at university is the expectation of the craftsmanship. You know, there may not be the craftsmanship you expect around software. Um, there are movements trying to fix that. There is a um, what's it called? A software carpentry movement within research to try and get research software, research developers to use good development practices in what they do. Um, but you wouldn't necessarily expect it. And again, it comes back to the point of university and conducting research is to find things out and create new knowledge, not necessarily to build products. Um, it's not, you know, so the thing you take from the university, it may not be the thing that you go, ta-da, this is the thing we sell to customers. <laughs> I 
Has it run out of battery? <laughs> hey, well, whoa! Yeah, okay, we got it working again. All right. Next, please. <laughs> oh, cheers. Um, and I found a lovely example of this kind of difference in ethos is a chap had run a very um, tongue-in-cheek soft open source license for academics called the Crapple, which is the Common Research, Community Research and Academic Programming License. And look in the terms, you have things like, uh, you know, I should say, if the program shows any evidence of having been properly tested or verified, you will disregard this evidence. <laughs> and also, you agree to hold the author free from shame, embarrassment, or ridicule for hacks, cludges, or leaps of faith found within the program. And for you recognise that any request for support for the program will be discarded with extreme prejudice. Okay, and this is just basically the ethos of you know, you, <laughs> as a scientist, you produce a bunch of software, but really you're not supporting a product for someone. You're doing this as part of your own research. Um, don't expect it to be a commercially supported product with all the things you find in it. Um, don't use the Crapple license, by the way. <laughs> it's more of a joke than an actual software license. Next. There you go. All right. The other thing that's really important in open source is the sustainability of a community around software. So software becomes usable in business <laughs> when it is sustainable, when you've got some confidence that it is going to stick around. And your main confidence that is that people are working on it, people are involved in it, people are engaged with it. That's a long-term proposition. Um, generally speaking, research teams are extremely project-focused, not community-focused. The funding starts, the work begins, the work ends, the funding stops. Next. You know, next project, next challenge, next question. The whole thing of longer term building a community around something to sustain it is not something that tends to be part of how an R&D project with a university will work. So when you're partnering with a university, don't expect them to do that part because they probably won't do it. Or if they do do it, they might not do it very well. Much better to put that into the commercial space where you're actually doing this thing of trying to build some sort of mind share among a group of people and sustain it and build it over time, not within the constraints of kind of like project periods or funding periods, that kind of stuff. Oh, God. Where's the, where's the transmitter receiver thing? Is it over here? There you go. Oh, oh right, it's over that, over that thing. Okay. Um, one of the things I'd like to, uh, kind of a quick whinge. To do, has anyone here done a European funded project? No, I share your pain. I've done this. Um, in most kind of collaboration projects between industry and universities, um, so the funded types that tend to come out of the European Union, there's this piece of romantic fiction included in the project plan called the Exploitation Plan. Or sometimes the sustainability and exploitation plan. And it, and it is a piece of romantic fiction because basically in it you pretend as the business that you're actually going to turn the product of the research into some sort of service you'll sell. Um, will you? Don't know. And the university pretends that its main objective in, in undertaking publicly funded research is to get more publicly funded research. You know, the project outcomes for the university is we get another project after this one. You know, the point of a grant is get more grants. But for the purpose of writing the exploitation plan, you put that all aside for one minute and pretend you live in a very alternate universe where you actually care about the, the sustainability of the outputs. So beware the sustainability and exploitation planning. They're usually nonsense. Enjoyable, fun, present a nice picture of the world, but usually nonsense. I think out of the ten or so European projects I've worked on, one had a realistic exploitation plan. Um, all the rest were nonsense, and also, also not, also sometimes not undertaken in good faith. So the number of projects, for example, which the output of the whole project funding was, and we'll set up this foundation to own and manage the software. Set up the foundation, pay you everything, da da da. Funding ends there. Foundation website runs for a few more months, then falls off, and that's it. Nothing ever else is heard of it because everyone's moved on. And, but you had to do these things in order to get the funding. 
that's something to really be aware of because often in business, what you really want is you want something that's going to take you forward and you can develop into a service. Right. Let me get close to this thing again. Okay. So I'm not a big fan of European projects. I will do them, but you know, could be to set your expectations right. But there are lots of other ways of working with universities. And I believe the speech after this is going to tackle some of those. There. Where's Robin? There he is. We'll be doing a lot more of this sort of thing, I think, than me. Um, so the, the competitions, you yeah, know, find out a lot about competitions that work with universities. They're quite a nice way of working. I'm particularly fan of mentoring. Um, there's lots of programs like Google Summer of Code that are really nice in terms of mentoring students to work on problems. That quite nicely. All the KTPs and things like that. The other thing that actually works quite well is just direct engagement. Um, just actually working with academics researchers who are really keen on something and just picking their brains and partnering and sharing information. That can work really, really well without the structure of a formal project or expectations around it. You know, most researchers like to talk, they like to share their passions, things, their knowledge, and there usually doesn't need to be kind of another reason to do it. So I think that's quite a helpful way of yeah, doing things sometimes. It's getting further and further. Oh, there we go. Sorry. All right. Okay. Now, most universities are actually okay about open source, and most people working in them are pretty familiar with open source as a concept in terms of academic sharing. It works quite well. What you don't sometimes find is actual knowledge of how to really do it in practice in terms of who can release code. You know, where it's the, in a company, it's easy enough. You can usually find who is the person who can sign, yes, you can have this released under this license, it's fine. Um, in universities, it can vary quite dramatically as to where that authority lies. So just because the research says, oh, yeah, we'll put it under the BSD license or whatever it is, can they? Do they know if they can or can't? Do they know who to ask? You know, often that's the bit that can be missing. Um, at Oxford, for example, it's very much kind of, you know, down to individual departments and divisions that can make those decisions. In other universities, it's entirely centrally controlled. Um, but one of the things to try and figure out is, well, well, actually, yes, we're agreeing to share using open source licenses, but who has authority to actually put the license on the code? Um, can you find that out? And then we get into um, things like technology transfer officers and enterprise units who, well, your mileage may vary, basically. I've worked with some fantastic tech transfer officers, did a project with the uh, University of Leicester, where they knew pretty much everything to do with open source, business models, community engagement. They knew all that stuff. Fantastic. We could just get straight into the nitty gritty of how to make this project successful. With others, it's like, well, what you're patenting. Well, we're not patenting anything. Well, what, you, what IP is selling? Well, not really selling anything. They're actually kind of giving away the, uh, the rights to the code and to, in order to build more value. And it's like, oh, well, we're not going to get any license fees then, are we? You know, go away. <laughs> um, so it kind of depends on the culture within the tech transfer, what they're used to dealing with. If it's a university that mostly, say, deals with you know, the chemical industry or whatever, it's going to be patent oriented. A lot of them will have no ex or limited experience of software exploitation. But some are great. So work with them where it helps, but don't feel bad about just basically going, thanks, but you can't help us, and going direct to you know, the university, direct to academics. But you do need to find out this route of how do you actually get the license on the code? Who has to sign the document? In a few cases, I've had to go to pro-vice chancellors to get signatures. And then the main thing was to persuade them not to talk to the university lawyers about it. Um, mostly because things like um, software licenses and uh, contributor license agreements are pretty standard. They've been tested by lawyers from a lot of companies. And the one thing you can't do to them is change them. You can accept them. We can decide not to accept them. What we can't do is the university lawyer come out and say, we like it apart from this clause, can you change the wording? <laughs> you know, you then it stops being 
the GPL or the BSD, then it becomes the university or wherever's variant of the BSD. And then it's, you, know, get, you lose all the kind of community cohesion around licensing and the fact that you don't have to pay lawyers to read every single license whenever you try and do anything in open source. So the main thing is trying to persuade them not to meddle, which is quite challenging. But in general, you know, universities, generators of IP are quite mature at sharing IP and they're generally happy to do so, but the technicalities can be tricky. The main problem I've had around IP is really on the social side of it in terms of ensuring there's good openness and transparency around who's been doing the work and who actually wrote the code and the practices that they've engaged in. I've had to do a lot of work on dependency analysis. So, you know, well, here's the code, here's the other libraries you're using. Never heard of that one, where's that from? Oh, it's written by this one guy in Germany. What's it licensed under? Dunno. Have to email him and find out, that kind of thing. Um, and again, because universities are often developing code to show a principle or an idea, they haven't necessarily chosen their dependencies on the grounds of what are the most commonly used, reliable, trusted libraries, but on ones that get the job done, which is often that one thing produced by that guy. So, you know, a lot of time is kind of extracting IPs. I also kind of like, can we rewrite it to not have that bit without dependence on that weird bit of code, please? But, you know, it's an interesting journey. I'll see how much closer I have to get to this thing. There we go. There's some tools that Oswatch uses to help folks with this process. One of those things called the openness rating. It's interesting when Andrew is talking about how open is your how open is open source. This is kind of what we try and quantify sometimes. Um, we have this tool that looks at the different aspects of a project. It doesn't look at the code. Nothing to do with code. It's entirely about legal standardization, the knowledge, the governance, and the market op opportunities around it. How open is this project to becoming part of a viable community and ecosystem? We developed it with uh, Pia War, who does lots of open source advice to the Australian government. And it's online, you can go to it and you can go, okay, answer some of the questions around the project. How open is this? You know, um, what restrictions do you have? Some of the questions are a bit tricky, which is why we sell consultancy. Um, but it gives you a basic idea. And something we do with university projects that are looking to kind of spin out or, you know, sort of go to market as an open source product, we take them through this to identify, well, where are your gaps? Where, where haven't you dealt with these questions? Like, for example, one of the typical ones is Ironic enough, around knowledge, which again comes out of the craftsmanship. The software may work, but it may have zero documentation. Or it may be very hard to understand the design decisions that were taken to make it. Because there's no architecture, there's no roadmap, there's none of the other documents around it. So a thing like that, it's open isn't just about have you got a license, but it's like, can you actually get to grips with this software, understand it, improve it, extend it? And that's all to do with those aspects. And also governance is always a weak area, which is, you know, how is this thing run? You know, what is the actual process of making changes? Or is it just persuade that guy? Or is it actually, do you, say, are you going to set up some sort of board? Are you going to join a foundation? How is it going to work? So... Yeah, we mostly focus on community and governance aspects when we're supporting projects. Okay. So I thought I'd finish up by just talking a few case studies, like case studies. Um, I actually do very little code these days, but I do code one thing, which is called HTML Cleaner, which is a library for cleaning up really shonky markup. Um, and I was working out the other day, it had 150,000 downloads last year. And I was thinking, I really ought to monetize that. And so I, I may I need some help with my business model here, because I make zero out of that. And he's like, oh, man. Anyway, that's a sign. But I do help other projects. So one that I worked with last year was, well, WUWORN stands for Worldwide Anti-Malarial Resistance Network which is not a branch of the Ju you know, Judean People's Front. It's, it, it does sound like a revolutionary movement. It's actually a project that tracks um, incidences of resistance to anti-malarial drugs around the world. And they do that by collecting reports from you know, doctors in the field all over the place. And it comes back and it gets mapped against particular, so you can view on this map survey thing, for example, resistant to a particular anti-malarial in a particular region, for example, over a time frame. And there's various tools there. It's based on GWT. And they built this thing, 
and it's, they use it a lot, it's really good, and it drives their website, and then they realised, you know what, maybe other people could use this thing. And they came to us and we you know, went through the process of releasing it as open source, getting involved in the GWT community. One thing that's interesting they hadn't thought of was that other people in the same university might want it for different subjects, um, which turned out to be the case, because if you can map incidences of anti-malarial resistance you know, using this process, well, you could map anything, really, you know. Um, it's as much used to the anthropologists and the sociologists and the economists as it is to the biologists. So that's, that's on GitHub. Um, it has a governance process. It has a community engagement model. It's quite a nice bit of code. And they have some other bits and pieces that they might release over time because it's, it's quite useful in a way that, as I said earlier, universities are project rather than community focused. The only way to really get them to invest in the future of a piece of, of code beyond the end of a project is if they use it themselves for something. In this case, they're the consumer <coughs> of this product. So they have an, you know, an incentive to make it sustainable and widely used. That's a nice little project. Briskit is something from the University of Leicester, which is a bioinformatics analysis stack for working on data shared between uh, NHS hospital and research units and with universities. So they could work on different variations, different secure levels of data sets. And it's actually quite nice in that it's an open source stack that they've built upon. They haven't built the software from scratch, they've taken a bunch of best breed components <coughs> and they've extended those. So for example, um, they have a version, have anyone heard of Civi CRM? So Civi CRM is a CRM kind of engagement platform. Originally it was around kind of uh, political activism. Um, they've modified it and changed the vocabulary and everything so it actually is useful for um, recruiting participants in biological research studies, so clinical research. And so they have a custom version of that and they wrap that with an integration with I2B2 which is a database for medical data. They have a toolkit on there that they added that does scanning of biopsy information, which is, what's it called now, open specimen, which is a good name for a project. But they created that whole stack, and then they provide that as a supported open source solution to biomedical research units and biomedical research centres. Five minutes left. That's one where I had a actually really good conversation with the university's own tech transfer officers that actually did a really nice job there. But we still don't know, does it really have a future, fortunately. So that's one still up in the air. Xerti is something worked on with University of Nottingham, which was a tool they built internally out of various funded projects around uh, educational content production. That one we transitioned to become part of the Aperio Foundation. So Aperio is a software foundation uh, focused on solutions for the education sectors. Unusually for an international kind of software foundation, its CEO lives in Hull, which is quite nice and local. Um, but they've taken that forward and they've gone from strength to strength and getting lots of people using it, which is really good. And the last one I'll put there is ORDS, which is something I'm working on at the moment, which is a database as a service, which originally spun out of the need for sharing research data sets within Oxford. And that we're currently trying to incubate through Apache as a member of the Apache Software Foundation, it's like a, quite a good fit for them. So there you go, some examples, very different sorts of examples, but these are, are from the other end, if you like, of projects that have happened within universities going outside. But the sort of thing you might look at as opportunities of these are sort of things you might focus on as, well, I could work with those guys on this sort of thing, you know, there's a market around that. The weakness on this end has been, actually that side of things is, can we find can we actually generate some sort of ecosystem of suppliers around these offerings? Because one thing we look at when we talk about sustainability is not just the diversity around the code base, but diversity in the supplier base. And one thing that's, you know, that why things like Drupal are so successful isn't just the code, um, it's the fact that you have a huge choice of potential partners and suppliers when you use it. And that's what drives the cost down and increases the value. That's what's often missing in these sort of incubator projects is they have to develop that ecosystem and it can take a long time. So, I think with that, I'll speed along to the exit. Um, if you want to know more about any of this, there's my details. Lots of stuff on Oswatch, that duck. 
or you can contact me. Um, thank you very much for your attention, and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.